Much to everybody's amazement that Ladybirds was a massive hit in America. Personally, I couldn't understand it. It was as if we'd had some giant publicity machine at our disposal. But we didn't. I was inundated with offers to appear on American television. And once people think you're a big film star, you become a big film star. I appeared on the Ed Sullivan TV show along with a then relatively unknown singer called Elvis Presley. And my appearance alone guaranteed record viewing figures. An enterprising journalist working for Time magazine did some research and wrote an in-depth profile of me under the headline, Whatever Happened to Baby Paul? My earlier Hollywood films were re-released and proved exceptionally popular with the teen generation. The response was so fantastic that Paramount Pictures offered me an exclusive contract to make 15 films over a 10-year period, an offer which I readily accepted. I had no qualms about leaving Britain behind. Shortly after settling in America, I met the woman who was to become my second wife. I'd been invited to a party held by the British ambassador in Washington. As I looked around the embassy, I couldn't help but be impressed by the cut glass chandeliers, the deep pile carpet, and the old masters hanging on every wall. I fell into conversation with one of the old masters who told me that he was a former head teacher of Eton College and that the ambassador liked the sheer Englishness of having first class educators dangling above the fireplace. The ambassador himself was friendly and greeted me with the words, Well, we've managed to make a success out of you. Although puzzled by the remark initially, I later assumed that he was simply expressing patriotic pride at my success in America. And then I saw her. My wife-to-be. Barbara Rothschild was rich, elegant, beautiful and rich. Her personal fortune exceeded the combined financial assets of Europe. She fell in love with my accent immediately and I, in my own way, fell in love with her. We got married and on the occasion of our first wedding anniversary in 1960, my darling Barbara bought me Portugal for my own personal use. Always photographed at every high society occasion, we became the most famous couple in America and therefore the world. We lived in the biggest mansion in Washington. Very much a woman of her time, Barbara was very keen on all kinds of modern scientific gadgets, and so our house was full of them. All the kitchen appliances, for example, reacted to spoken commands. If you placed a chicken in the oven and said, Cook! in a loud voice, the oven would automatically cook the bird. Other gadgets reacted to mere vowel sounds. In the living room, you only had to utter a contented R sound as you sat back in the sofa to conjure up a Labrador, a log fire, and a balloon of vintage brandy from behind a curtain. Yes, we were happy. My first film for Paramount was a huge financial success, and at 30 years old I was on top of the world. As I sit here watching the afternoon sun disappearing behind the orange groves that are a spectacular feature of my luxurious Spanish villa, it gives me tremendous satisfaction to relive the golden memories of those halcyon years. Belinda, my fifth wife, has still not returned home, however. Being of Latin temperament, she struggles with the concept of punctuality, but of course I love her dearly. I don't get on with her side of the family, so I'd much rather she visited her sister in Argentina on her own. Better that than have me endure the idiotic rantings of my brother-in-law, who seems to believe that belching is an Olympic sport, judging by the amount of practice he puts into it. And also, it would be extremely dangerous for me to leave the country. I long ago got used to the idea that I will die in Spain. Even if I don't, one thing's for certain. I'll never set foot in Britain again. Still, I dare say my wife will turn up shortly full of apologies and vodka. She's nervous of air travel, poor thing, and drinks excessively to knock herself out for the flight. My film career went from strength to strength. In 1961, I received an Oscar nomination in the Best Actor category for my performance as a Cornish smuggler providing illicit alcohol to a tiny village. I loved that film, and always thought its title, Rum Cove, was a clever play on words. In 1962, for our third wedding anniversary, I bought Barbara the world's most expensive diamond. The Raj stone was impossible to insure, and so we kept it in a large safe lined with the softest velvet. We made sure that everyone knew we had it. 
Occasionally honoured guests were allowed to look at an x-ray of the safe with the diamond showing up as a dark lump in the middle. In 1963 came an emotional time for me. I was voted the biggest international film star in the world by the readers of Sprocket Holes magazine. There was no doubt that everybody in the world loved me. I don't think anyone would have blamed me for thinking that it would last forever. But it didn't. In 1964, my past returned to haunt me. As many of you know, an obscure publication that I won't even deign to name here printed details of my wartime efforts to entertain the Nazis, but the subtleties of my true valour in the war completely passed them by. Within a matter of days, it was front-page stuff all over the world, and the fickle press made mincemeat of me. The State of Israel immediately banned all my films and staged a trial which found me guilty of collaboration with the enemy. Sentence was handed down and I was executed in my absence, and although patently absurd, the ruling was supported by international law and I was officially pronounced dead. This meant that although I was still clearly alive, I was in fact to all intents and purposes non-existent. Nobody was allowed to talk to me or acknowledge my presence in any way. Because I was dead, my wife Barbara received all my worldly assets according to the terms of my will. And to add insult to injury, she changed all the locks to all the doors in our Hollywood mansion in case I should attempt to haunt her from beyond the grave. Being dead ruined my life. It was impossible to get a good table in a restaurant, not even one by the door. I was penniless and friendless, and even Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who I'd come to regard as a friend, cut me dead in a supermarket. I tried to contact my widow on several occasions until a message was relayed to me through an exceedingly roundabout route. But it was considered the height of social disgrace to accept telephone calls from a corpse. The rest of America shunning me I could understand. There is a strong Jewish lobby in American politics and their concerns have to be addressed. But for my ex-wife to behave as if the person she had known and loved had somehow died with me was too much to bear. And so I killed her. One night I broke into the house and bludgeoned her to death with the honorary Oscar presented to me by the Academy for my rare skills in bringing joy to the world. I reasoned that if I couldn't enjoy my worldly goods, then neither could she. Of course, being dead, I couldn't be charged with a murder. I left America a penniless non-citizen, and I arrived back at London Airport just before Christmas 1964. It was almost exactly 30 years to the day since I'd first returned from Hollywood in absolute disgrace, and here I was going through the same old routine again. At least Britain's relationship with Israel wasn't as close as the Americans, and upon my arrival I was immediately arrested by customs for flying without a valid ticket. At the American end I had simply wandered onto the plane ignored by all the airline officials. Once it had been established that I was a British citizen, and that Pan Am had no record of me ever having been on the flight however, I was released without charge. I spent Christmas with my parents in their Neo-Georgian bungalow in Whitstable. It was fun to do simple family things again, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed watching them put up all the decorations, preparing the Christmas turkey and dealing with the mountains of washing up afterwards. Over that holiday period I spent a great deal of time thinking about my future. I was 34 years old and had spent my entire life in show business. Did I have the stamina to relaunch my career in Britain? Was it really worth climbing back onto that insane roller coaster? Dad recommended that I contact Billy Costell. After all, my troubles always occurred when I was out of the country and away from my circle of influence. My two trips to America and my cabaret work in Berlin had all ended disastrously, so perhaps there was a lesson to be learned. As per the usual manner, I placed an advert in Dalton's Weekly and awaited Billy's response. The gist of his reply, which incidentally was written in chalk on a brick wall near my parents' home, was that it might well be a good idea to take a break from the business, and had I considered the possibility of running a small antique shop in East Sussex. As on countless previous occasions, Billy had correctly judged my mood and was pointing me towards the future. Because I had so much time on my hands, I started thinking about the extraordinary phenomenon that was Billy Castell. He'd represented the family for nearly 40 years, but none of us knew what he looked like, or sounded like, or even how old he was. 
Why did he conduct business in such an unusual manner? Why bother chalking a message on a wall when it would be so much simpler to send a postcard? Why was a teapot thrown at me in Tottenham Court Road? And how, back in the 1930s, did Billy manage to place a message on the B side of a gramophone record informing my father that baby Paul was booked into the London Palladium? At the time, Dad assumed the voice belonged to Billy, but we've had no proof of that. And exactly how did he manage to persuade King George V to rehearse the act for several weeks? Dozens of questions, and only one way to answer them. I decided to find Billy Castell. Dalton's Weekly seemed a good place to start. I made an appointment to see George Thomas, the managing director of Dalton's Weekly, and travel to London to meet him. I concocted a story about wanting to make a feature film set in their offices. Working on the assumption that ordinary people knew nothing about show business, I bamboozled George Thomas with spurious detail and erroneous information until I had him eaten out the palm of my hand. We very much see this film as an international blockbuster, I told him. A murder is committed, and the managing director of Dalton's Weekly sets out to find the killer, but soon stumbles into a web of intrigue. A web of intrigue, repeated Mr Thomas. Sounds very interesting. Oh, it is, I said. And we see Cary Grant playing you, and Alfred Hitchcock will direct it. Alfred Hitchcock, he said. That would be wonderful. Well, of course, it has to be authentic, I continued. Mr Hitchcock would insist upon it. We must get every detail right. The murderer places adverts in the second-hand fridge section of Dalton's Weekly, so obviously we need to do some research in that direction. Second-hand fridge section, repeated Mr Thomas in a somewhat bemused fashion. Yes, and Michael Caine's going to be in it. Michael Caine? Yes, and Elizabeth Taylor. I was deliberately giving him no time to think. Take this advert, for example, I said, producing a recent copy of Dalton's Weekly with one of Billy's messages ringed in blue ink. Who placed it and where do they live? George Thomas took the magazine from me. Oh, um, this is one of Billy Castell's, he said. I believe he's a theatrical agent. I feigned amazement. Billy Castell? I haven't seen him for years. Where's he living these days? I'll check the files, he said and spoke to his secretary via the intercom. Within 35 seconds she entered the office clutching a piece of paper. I resisted the enormous temptation to grab it off her and run out of the building laughing maniacally. We send all these bills to number 34B Goldhawk Road. Tell me, is there any chance that I could meet Miss Taylor? He wittered on in his vein for some time, but I was too stunned to take any notice. 34B Goldhawk Road? Mum and Dad's second-hand shop had been at 34A Goldhawk Road. Could Billy really have been a neighbour of ours? I thanked George Thomas and promised that MGM would be in touch within the hour. I left the building and caught a taxi to the Goldhawk Road. Twenty-five minutes later I stood outside Mum and Dad's old shop which was now an off-licence. The number above the door read 34A. The shops on either side of the off-licence were numbered 32 and 36. So where was 34B? I stood on the pavement wondering what on earth I was going to do next when I saw a postman walking towards me. 34B, mate, he said. It's round the back. Take the next road on the left, follow that until you reach an alleyway. Go down the alleyway, pass three huge dustbins. It's the door on your left. I thanked him, walked around the corner, down the alleyway, past the three huge dustbins and saw a door marked 34B and 34C. I pushed it open and found a staircase directly in front of me. Fighting the impulse to run up it two at a time, I grabbed the banister, took a deep breath and walked up the stairs in the most nonchalant manner I could muster. As I climbed upwards, I silently rehearsed my opening remark. Ah, Mr Castell, we meet at last. No, that sounded like a line from a cheap spy novel. By the top of the stairs, I'd settled on the rather unimaginative Hello Billy. The door at the top was marked Gosport Travel. This didn't bother me, because knowing Billy's love of secrecy, I hardly expected it to read Castell's theatrical agency don't bother to knock. I pushed through the door and found a middle-aged Indian man sitting behind a grubby desk. The walls were covered with maps of the world, and travel brochures were scattered all over the room. I glanced around, looking for a door that clearly wasn't there. I'm looking for 34B, I said. It's back downstairs, replied the man, immediately to the left of the front door as you come in. I went back down the stairs, and there it was.
34B. I knocked on the door, but nobody answered. I tried the handle, but it was locked. The front door opened behind me and the postman entered. I see you found it then, he said, pushing a couple of envelopes with a letterbox. Yes, I said, thinking quickly. I'm from Dalton's Weekly. We haven't heard from Mr. Castell for a few weeks, and I was just checking that he hadn't changed address or anything like that. See much of him? I said, hoping to trap the postman into some detailed description of what Billy looked like. Never set eyes on him, mate, he replied as he climbed the stairs towards Gosport Travel. If you're worried about him, why don't you write him a letter? Which, of course, was the very last thing I should do. Having found Billy's office, it hardly made sense to let him know I was on his trail. I wanted to meet him, or at least talk to him. I resolved to find his telephone number. In 1965, London was beginning to swing. Young people had money to spend and the shops were full of daring new fashions. Apparently, there was a fresh spirit of optimism in the air. But I missed it all. For all I knew, policemen were tap dancing in Trafalgar Square and the Prime Minister was handing out free money to anyone who had a big smile on their face. I missed it all because I spent the majority of 1965 tracking down Billy Castell's phone number. First, I moved out of my parents' bungalow in Whitstable and rented a tiny bedsit that was frankly disgusting, but at least had the advantage of being near the Goldhawk Road. Now, how exactly do you discover somebody's ex-directory telephone number? Well, in short, this is how I did it. Directory inquiries told me that Gosport Travel's telephone number was 438724. I felt safe in assuming that Billy's number would begin with the same two digits. Now I had to find the last four numbers. There are 10,000 possible variants of a four-figure number, so I got hold of a London telephone directory and crossed out every single number listed without a 4-3 prefix. This reduced the possible combinations to 807. I dialed each one of these numbers in turn. On some, I got a line disconnected tone, so I immediately eliminated them from the list. On others, if there was no answer after a minute, I'd make a note of the number in my to be phoned back column. For those numbers who answered, I pretended to be a telephone engineer. Oh, I'm sorry to disturb you, it's the telephone engineer here. We've had a couple of reports that Gosport Travel's phone line is constantly engaged. I wonder if you could pop upstairs and ask them to replace the receiver correctly. A simple enough request designed to confuse everybody but Billy Castell. And everyone I spoke to on the phone was confused. None had heard of Gosport Travel, and the vast majority volunteered the information that I'd got through to a private residence, and if there was a travel agent upstairs, they were certainly being very quiet about it. Finally, after just a few months, I reduced the list to 15 numbers. 15 numbers that nobody answered no matter what time I phoned them, day or night. From there, it was easy. I went to a telephone box just down the road from Billy's office and dialed the first number. I left the phone dangling off its receiver, came out of the phone box, walked down the alleyway, pushed through the door marked 34B and 34C and placed my ear to the door of Billy's office. There was no phone ringing. I went back to the phone box, dialed another number and repeated the process. Finally, phone number 12 came through. I dialed 438432, made my way back to the office and heard Billy's phone ringing through the door. Success! Well, success of sorts. For the following month, I phoned Billy's number every 20 minutes. I sometimes even set the alarm clock for three in the morning just to wake me up to call Billy. But the phone just rang and rang. Finally, out of sheer frustration, I took the law into my own hands. In the early hours of 29th of September, I pushed past the three huge dustbins and shoulder-charged the door marked 34B and 34C. I kicked the lock in on Billy's door, pushed it open, switched on the light and found myself standing in a slightly larger than average cupboard. The walls were bare, the only item of furniture was a small stool with a telephone placed on top of it. Under the telephone was this typed written note addressed to me. Hello Paul. It's nearly a year since your return from Hollywood, and I'm glad you took my advice and decided to take some time off from the business. Commercial television wants you to host a brand new game show. A man called Justin Wheeler will contact you tomorrow. Best regards, Billy. I glanced back to the top of the page and then looked at my watch. It was 2.25am. The top of the page was marked 2.15am. 
How could Billy know I would break into his office on the 29th of September and how could he predict to the nearest ten minutes the exact time? This man was amazing. Instead of solving the mystery, I'd created another larger mystery. All I'd done was to waste several months tracking down a phone number that was no good to me at all. I went back to the bedsit, drank three stiff whiskies and a limp cognac. I didn't sleep well for the rest of that night. Justin Wheeler telephoned me at 10.30 the following morning. ITV wanted me to host a brand new game show called You're the Mugs. The idea, which was very popular at the time, was to stage elaborate hoaxes on members of the public and film their reactions with hidden cameras. On one occasion, I remember, we told a couple they'd been left half a million pounds by a relative they had never heard of. We drove them to London and they met a bogus solicitor who confirmed every detail. They were then encouraged to go on a spending spree for several days, until finally we broke the news not only was there no inheritance, but they had also run up a debt of £15,000. At this point, as they did every week, the rest of the family emerged from behind a curtain to humiliate the unfortunate couple by shouting in unison, You're the mugs! With a mixture of different hoaxes every week, You're the mugs proved to be a great hit with the general public and I was voted ITV Personality of the Year for 1966. I was kept busy throughout that year, and the next, so I didn't really spend much time thinking about Billy Castell and that strange little office cum cupboard of his. My domestic situation also took a distinct turn for the better. I moved out of the bedsit and into a three-bedroomed ground-floor mansion flat just behind the British Museum. And I married the hostess of You're the Mugs, a charming young lady called Melissa, who satisfied my every need. We were photographed everywhere together. First nights, West End restaurants, switching on the Christmas lights in Regent Street. We became one of the showbiz couples of the 60s. I was flooded with requests for various charities, but it was impossible to say yes to everybody, so I concentrated on the causes that were most likely to get me an OBE. Children and animals are usually a good bet. And so in 1967 I became life president of the Blind Dogs for the Guide Society, an obscure organisation whose chief aim is to supply blind dogs to girl guides. Apparently it teaches the little darlings responsibility, but it meant very little work for me and loads of personal publicity, so I was happy to go along with it all. At first, life at home with Melissa was everything it should be. We entertained heads of state every other weekend, and soon our gin rummy night became the talk of the Commonwealth. But behind the jolly public facade, trouble was brewing. I'd first started to drink heavily in 1965. Sitting in a bed sit all day, crossing numbers out of a phone book isn't much fun unless you do it with a bottle of scotch inside you. Perhaps I should make it clear that it was the contents that were inside me, rather than the bottle itself. I'd hate to conjure up any unnecessarily crude imagery. And so, with wealth at my fingertips, I slowly succumbed to the powers of drink. One of my favourite drinking clubs was Happy Sam's, a tiny little place tucked behind a small courtyard in Soho. Membership was only offered to those people whose photograph had appeared on the front cover of the TV Times. I was proud to be part of that select group. Amongst my regular drinking companions was Alastair Crowley, the notorious Satanist. It featured on the cover of TV Times in 1963 to publicise his role as guest commentator for that year's FA Cup final. Unfortunately, the self-proclaimed master of the black arts had a very shaky knowledge of the offside rule and so was quietly dropped the following year. I always found Alistair a completely charming man who loved nothing better than reading out the jokes printed on the back of matchboxes. I knew that millions regarded him as the spawn of Beelzebub, but you know how people like to gossip. I didn't realise that he had in fact died in 1947, but being satanic he could shrug off this minor detail. Some nights I wouldn't get home from Happy Sam's until five o'clock in the morning. I would spin Melissa some yarn about falling asleep on a chair somewhere, and for a while she believed me. But my regular nightly excursions into Soho gave her the perfect opportunity to sit at home and think. Although we were the perfect showbiz couple, in financial terms we were far from being equal. On You're the Mugs I was paid a star salary, while Melissa was paid a hostess's salary. Absolutely fair, I'm sure you'll agree. But she didn't see it that way. 
no matter how gently I put it to her, she could never understand that her position in the show was that of an empty-headed blonde who could be replaced at the drop of a hat. I suppose if I had been home more in the evenings, I could have dealt with the problem more diplomatically by telling her to shut up every five minutes. But I didn't. I was spending every available night in Happy Sam's. Behind my back, Melissa negotiated a contract with the BBC to star in her very own chat show. The first I knew about it was the morning after the first programme had been broadcast. I've never been an avid newspaper reader, and because I was out every night I wasn't seeing any television either. A taxi driver broke the news to me. Your wife's show is a bloody disgrace. I asked him what he was talking about and he showed me the first page of the Daily Mirror. Funny man's wife is rubbish, read the headline. Well, you can imagine the shock. It's never a good move to be associated with failure in this business and to be married to it is a cardinal sin. I directed the cab back to my house and confronted Melissa in the kitchen. She was totally unrepentant. She didn't seem to care tuppence about my career and instead kept going on about the unfairness of the press. Then she dropped the bombshell. Where would your precious career be if people knew you were out drinking with Alistair Crowley every night? There was a silence between us. We both perfectly understood the nature of the threat. My status as the country's foremost family entertainer would be placed in severe jeopardy. I had to think quickly. I apologised to Melissa immediately and agreed that I had behaved abysmally towards her. I promised to stand by her no matter what the press said about a new show. And although I didn't have to, I agreed that we should be paid exactly the same money on the next series of You're the Mugs. I made all these promises in the sure knowledge that I would never have to keep them. Because of course I had already made the decision to kill her. This was becoming a habit. As luck would have it, Melissa died in a fatal car crash the next day so I didn't have to bother. A mentally unbalanced choreographer called Tommy Whitehaven had been so incensed by Melissa's chat show that he had taken it upon himself to drain the brake fluid out of her car. By an extraordinary piece of bad luck, when Melissa completely failed to stop at the traffic lights by Tottenham Court Road Underground Station, she actually knocked Tommy Whitehaven over before being hit full square by a double-decker bus. The whole sequence of events would have remained a total mystery if I hadn't, by sheer chance, been walking past at the time of the accident. I was the first person to reach Tommy Whitehaven, and I just wished to God that somebody other than me had heard him confess to his crime before he passed away. The inquest was very upsetting, particularly as all the cameramen outside seemed to take a perverse pleasure in photographing my face from the wrong angle. The funeral itself, however, was a splendid occasion, and I think we did Melissa proud. It was certainly the finest send-off for a quiz show hostess that this country has ever seen. We made one more series of You're the Mugs, but the British public didn't take to Melissa's replacement too well, and after five successful years, we decided to call it a day. However, the drinking continued. Occasionally, I thought of contacting Alcoholics Anonymous, but I couldn't find their phone number anywhere, so so much for anonymity. I suppose I drank because doing a quiz show for five years was financially rewarding, but hardly represented a challenge anymore. In the past, I'd been a famous actor. In 1973, I was chiefly known as the man in a three-piece suit who humiliated people for the purposes of light entertainment. My career desperately needed a new direction, so I placed an advert in Dalton's Weekly. Billy's reply told me to contact the head of BBC sitcom as soon as possible, the BBC wanted me to play the part of a big game hunter living in Nairobi who shot loads of lions and was rude to his servants. I didn't like the big game hunter, Nairobi, lions and servants element, but apart from that it sounded great. Thanks to my comments, it eventually mutated into a comedy about a very tall angry man with a moustache running a hotel in Torquay, but I never shared in the programme's success. By now my life was desperate. I hadn't been on television for almost a year. I was in danger of being forgotten. I was offered the occasional game show which only confirmed that I'd made the cardinal mistake of getting myself typecast. My predicament brought to mind an American character actor I'd met in Hollywood in the early 1960s. His name was Willard Glengoso. He had first leapt to prominence with his portrayal of the Beast in the film The Beast from 50,000 Fathoms. If ever a man was born to act inside a green rubberized suit, it was Willard. 
Such was his impact in the movie that he was flooded with offers to appear in all kinds of films, on the strict understanding that all his scenes would feature him in a green rubberized suit. If you ever wondered who the huge reptile is serenade Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady, now you know. But soon the novelty wore off, and Willard was reduced to making guest appearances in shoddy American soap operas. Eventually he went mad and was shot down from an aeroplane while attempting to climb the Empire State Building. Showbiz is littered with a thousand such casualties. Unless I got the break I needed, I was destined to become one of them. But salvation came in the most unexpected form. Totally out of the blue, I was awarded an OBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. What a result! Blind dogs and girl guides had suddenly kicked in. When one embarks on charity work, it's always heartwarming to see a positive result at the end, and what could be more uplifting than an OBE? I appeared in all the papers the following day, and I was interviewed by News at 10 and the 9 o'clock news, which helped to firmly remind the British public about how much they loved me. People stopped me in the street and shook me by the hand. Through the warmth, generosity, and the hero worship of others, I began putting my life back into some sort of order. I managed to keep the drinking under some sort of control for many years after that. Although still addicted, I couldn't bear the idea of jeopardising my respectable image by allowing my fans to see me walking down Oxford Street stinking of booze and covered in vomit. And a lot of people in my business share the same attitude. In April 1974, I went to Buckingham Palace to receive my award from the Queen. I was proud to take my place amongst the lifeboat rescue men and ex-football managers. A lot of people criticise the honour system, but generally speaking those people don't have OBEs. I'm sure it's sour grapes on their part. It's well known that the Queen is adept at putting people at their ease, and after discussing different types of water with a lifeboat man standing alongside, she eventually turned her attention to me. She was gracious enough to say how much she enjoyed my work, and that as far as she was concerned, you're the mugs described perfectly the monarchy's role within the British constitution. I wasn't quite sure what she meant by this, but I smiled politely and then ignored her. A few minutes later, however, I found myself talking to Prince Charles, and we hit it off immediately. To my surprise, he was a huge fan of my radio show in the 1950s. He told me that he particularly liked the character of Corporal Backwards, and he then went on to say that in his experience, the character did not exclusively belong to the world of fiction. He paused, with a smile playing about his lips, and for a moment I wasn't quite sure how I was supposed to react. And then to my left I noticed a footman holding up a white card with laugh written on it. This cued warm and generous laughter around the room and I was happy to join in with it, although for the life of me I didn't know what we were supposed to be laughing at. Prince Charles continued, and I can assure you that backwardness as a characteristic is not entirely confined to the rank of corporal within the British Army. I noticed everybody's eyes flickering across to the footman, who duly produced the white card. We all once again laughed uproariously. I was beginning to get the hang of this, and so after a few more minutes of conversation, I boldly attempted a joke of my own. It strikes me, your majesty, that if some of our generals are backward, that can only be a good thing. At least we can detect some kind of movement from them. This remark was met by total silence. I nudged the footman to my left, but no white card was produced. All eyes were on the prince. To my relief, he eventually chuckled, then giggled, and finally roared with laughter. The footman displayed the white card, and everybody else joined in. When the merriment subsided, Prince Charles shook me by the hand, told me that I was a most amusing fellow, and would I be free to dine with him that evening? I of course accepted. I dined with Prince Charles on several occasions throughout 1974 and we became firm friends. Reports of our regular dinners together quickly filtered into the upper echelons of society. Soon I was invited to dine with the aristocracy in all the most fashionable houses in London. The majority of people I met had never heard of You're the Mugs, and some of them even denied there was such a thing as ITV. I was purely accepted on the grounds that I regularly dined with Prince Charles just goes to show how unsnobbish these people really are. I became close friends with the Marchmont family, and their youngest daughter in particular. Emily was 19 years old, and the epitome of the English rose. She had a big red face that used to bloom every summer. 
She was enchanted by my stories about the variety theatre, which was so far removed from her everyday experience I might as well have been talking about Manchester. I loved the charming way she described all those below her on the social scale as losers. On the 14th of February, 1975, we announced our engagement to be married. Now that I was moving in such exalted circles, I desperately needed the huge income that goes hand in hand with a hit television show. I placed an advert in Dalton's Weekly and awaited Billy's response. I was rather hoping that he might suggest something upmarket along the lines of Paul Merton's Guide to English Stately Butlers, so I was rather disappointed to receive a call from ITV offering me a brand new game show called Lucky Beggars. The idea of this one was that the programme would celebrate people who had enjoyed a great deal of luck in their lives. We would tell their individual stories, and then the studio audience would vote for the person that they believed fully deserved a plastic horseshoe with the words Lucky Beggar stenciled on the back. I liked the idea, chiefly because nothing else was being offered to me, and so I signed a contract and we immediately embarked on a series of 65 shows. ITV wanted more, but in my experience, if you record more than 65 in any one go, it's impossible to keep the standard up. We recorded 13 shows a day and finished the series in a week. I married Emily on 25th of October, 1975. We spent our honeymoon in the penthouse suite of the Dorchester Hotel, then taking pot shots at commuters with a high-powered air rifle. After the honeymoon, I recorded another series of Lucky Beggars, and we then settled down to married life in my ground-floor mansion flat behind the British Museum. We quickly became the society couple. We attended all the high-class functions and found ourselves dining out every single night. This saved us a great deal of money and we didn't have to worry about the washing up. Despite riding the social merry-go-round, I still found time to visit Prince Charles on a regular basis. On one such evening, after sharing a particularly fine bottle of Amontillado, Charles dismissed the footman and his white card with laugh written on it, which I took to mean that our previous frivolous conversation was about to take a serious turn. My instinct was correct. I don't know if you've ever seen a grown man sobbing uncontrollably. I certainly hadn't, and neither had Prince Charles, so we talked about something else. The conversation that followed was to change my life. According to the Prince, Rumours had circulated among the royal family for years about the possible existence of an elaborate system of tunnels underneath London. Yes, I wanted to say it's called the Piccadilly Line, but as the man with the white card had left, there didn't seem to be any point. The prince then went on to tell me that according to legend, these secret tunnels had been built just after the turn of the century on the express wishes of Edward VII. Apparently, he loved to travel around the capital in total secrecy, and because he was the king, nobody had the nerve to tell him it was a stupid idea that would cost billions. But the British Empire was at the height of its wealth, and apparently the tunnels were built. Charles then explained that the reason why he was telling me this was because of a persistent rumour that a tunnel definitely existed between Buckingham Palace and a certain ground-floor flat behind the British Museum. His words had exactly the desired effect on me. Would this ground floor flat be situated at 41 Bedford Road, I asked. It would, he replied. Your own flat, of course. If such a tunnel exists, it would be easier to locate it at your end rather than search under the floorboards here at the palace. We have 93 rooms on the ground floor alone. I see. Are you suggesting, Your Highness, that I should go home tonight and rip the floorboards up, I said. Oh, no, 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 replied the Prince. I mention it in case you might have come across something peculiar in your cellar, perhaps, that might verify the truth of the rumour. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Your Highness. The cellar floor is solid concrete, and while there may have once been a trap door or some sort of contraption, I can assure you that it no longer exists. I was down there only the other day, cataloguing my collection of vintage wines, and if there was a trap door, I would surely have stumbled upon it by now. Prince Charles reluctantly accepted this disappointing news and we moved on to other subjects. After a rather intense debate about the relative merits of milk, I developed a rather nasty headache and informed my host that I really should be making my way home. Prince Charles kindly phoned me a minicab and I was back in my ground floor mansion flat before midnight. I felt slightly bad about lying to the heir to the throne, but I reckoned he was probably used to it. How many lies had I told him exactly? Three to be precise. 
I had never been down to the cellar in my life, I have never collected vintage wine, and I didn't have a severe headache. But if there was a tunnel, I certainly wasn't going to share it with anyone, let alone Prince Charles. I wasted no time in dashing home and making my way down to the cellar. To my absolute astonishment, I found a solid concrete floor. What on earth had Prince Charles been wittering on about? And then... And then I noticed a tiny red button on the wall, just two inches above the floor. I pressed it and a section of the wall slid back. I peered inside the hole and saw a narrow flight of stairs heading down into the gloom. I found a light switch at the top of the stairs and turned it on. The stairs were extremely steep and there wasn't much headroom at first. But as I made my way down them, the passageway opened up considerably. At the bottom I found a little wooden platform. Running alongside the platform was a narrow gauge railway track, and resting on the rails were three small electric cars. I climbed into the first one and studied the controls. I found five buttons on the dashboard, marked Start, Stop, Forward, Reverse and Radio 2. There wasn't much future in Reverse because of the two cars behind me, so I pressed the Start button and headed off down the dark tunnel. Two headlights on the front of the electric car illuminated part of the track ahead of me. After several minutes of travelling in a straight line, the track veered to the left and I reckoned that I must be heading out of central London. I passed several little wooden platforms on the way, but I kept going, expecting to reach some sort of terminus sooner or later. I'd been travelling for about 20 minutes when I passed a sign reading, West London. Curiosity got the better of me, so I stopped the car at the next available wooden platform and got out. I climbed up the steps ahead of me and came to a brick wall. I pushed a button on the wall and it slid back. I walked through. I was in a tiny little room. I switched on the light and recognised it immediately. I was in Billy Castell's office. Well, that was more than enough for one night, so I took the electric car home, drank a few brandies and fell contentedly to sleep. I woke up the next morning extremely cheery. Emily left the house early to attend one of her Abolish the NHS meetings and I made myself a cup of tea in the kitchen. The previous night's adventure had proved that Prince Charles was right and that he wasn't just a lonely figure of fun living in a fantasy world of make-believe. I had also discovered how Billy had managed to leave a typewritten note for me ten minutes before my breaking into his office ten years earlier. Clearly, he'd been there up to the last minute before escaping through the secret tunnel. I finished the cup of tea, and three minutes later I was back down there again, riding my electric car under London. Over the next few months I explored a great deal of the system. I discovered routes that took me to, amongst other places, the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, the Oval Cricket Ground, and the House of Lords. And I eventually found the stairs that led to directly inside Buckingham Palace, the first time in my life I was truly happy. It was always something new to discover. One day I stopped at a wooden platform, climbed the stairs, and found myself inside a pillar box in Piccadilly Circus. I could see Eros clearly through the slot. It was with some regret that I resurfaced to record another series of lucky beggars. I decided early on not to tell Emily about the tunnels because they had to remain secret. It was half the fun of them. She was always out of the house every day, so I had ample opportunity to go where I liked. In the summer of 1976, we holidayed in Monte Carlo. I ignored the temptation of the crowded casinos, and instead amused myself by being rude about foreigners in a very loud voice. This pleased Emily a great deal, and I can still hear her peals of laughter every time I shouted Monsieur Fatass at various portly Frenchmen trying to squeeze themselves in and out of open top sports cars. It was fun. But on the whole, I'd rather have been at home. Underground. At the end of 1976, I was once again voted ITV Personality of the Year. I celebrated by drinking champagne in the centre circle of Wembley Stadium at half past three in the morning. The ITV award meant nothing to Emily and our circle of friends, and this started to bother Emily. I suppose she wanted to be proud of me, but this was impossible if my career was generally considered inconsequential fluff, and therefore a subject best avoided at the dinner table. In order to please Emily, I turned down another series of lucky beggars, I was sick of it anyway, 
and instead auditioned for the Royal Shakespeare Company. I knew this would impress her friends. I suppose in the back of my mind was the thought that quiz show hosts never get enough credit in this business, so I might as well do something poncy for a change. But tragedy struck. I didn't pass the audition. Can you imagine that? Still, in the end, who really wants to spend two years talking a load of mumbo-jumbo to a bunch of people who don't know what you're on about and will happily pay through the nose of the privilege? Emily, of course, had told everybody that I was joining the Royal Shakespeare Company, and once the news of my failure had got around, I became an object of derision. Emily even had the nerve to tell me that I was becoming an embarrassment. I got angry with her, and I, I suppose if I'd been in my right mind, I never would have accepted a children's television series. I can barely bring myself to talk about the horror that was Uncle Paul and his happy hippo. The first series was so popular with the under fives that I was persuaded to embark on a nationwide tour with a fully grown hippopotamus called Augustine. The hippo's speciality was impressions. I put a giant pair of glasses on its face while a three-piece backing band played Don't Go Breaking My Heart. This stupid attempt to represent Elton John was always greeted with such enthusiastic applause you'd swear it must be a perfect likeness. As far as I was concerned, the hippo simply stood there creating a hell of a stink, but nobody else seemed at all bothered by its lack of miming skills. I will concede that Augustine had a remarkable range. There was nobody she could do. Maurice Chevalier, Dennis Healy, Bobby Charlton, she couldn't do the lot. God knows why, but with the right props and right backing music, people roared and applauded. You know, in my opinion, you can't claim to have experienced all of life's great riches until you've travelled the length of Britain wedged in the back of a transit van with a stinking hippopotamus. It made the musicians who came with us almost bearable. Uncle Paul and his happy hippo were sold all over the world. Children and their parents loved me everywhere. In one sense, the programme had given me back the worldwide fame I had always craved. And the trouble was, I was now known to millions as the man with a hippo. On my own, nobody wanted to know. But stick me next to a hippopotamus and suddenly I was everybody's friend. Emily, who had never understood show business, began to resent me rather heavily during this period. We had several arguments along the lines of you love that hippo more than you love me and despite my denials she began to turn against me. She simply couldn't understand why I had to spend two months in Bogota promoting overseas sales. One night we had a blazing row. She said her friends laughed at me. Although none of them watched much television, Uncle Paul and his happy hippo had reached such a level of popularity it was impossible to be unaware of the phenomenon. It's either that hippo or me, she screamed, which was a ridiculous ultimatum considering that I was locked into a three-year contract. She threatened divorce, which is the kiss of death in the world of children's entertainment, and so, with great reluctance, I strangled her with a ribbon attached to my OBE, cut her body into tiny pieces, and fed them to Augustine during a live broadcast from the Ideal Home exhibition at Olympia. Naturally, I was more upset than anybody that my wife had completely disappeared, and despite the best efforts of Scotland Yard, her body was never found. As a mark of respect, Augustine wore a black hat at the memorial service. Getting her to sit in one of the pews was a hell of a job, but it didn't make a great photo opportunity. Some might think, what kind of man feeds his wife to a hippopotamus? But those kind of people don't understand the pressures of my business. In 1977, the double act received the highest honour when Augustine and myself were invited to play the London Palladium for that year's Royal Variety performance. Amazingly, despite my palace connections over the years, this was the first time in my adult life that I'd been asked to perform officially before royalty. Traditionally, the audience on these occasions can be rather stuffy and slow to respond to the marvellous entertainment paraded in front of them, but I was confident that we could win them over. 1977 marked the Queen's first 25 years on the throne, and so I set about devising a new act suitable for the occasion. We rehearsed for six weeks, and by the morning of the big night, I was confident we had a show-stopping routine. Well, we certainly stopped the show that evening, but not in the way I'd intended. A great deal has been written about that famous night, much of it false. So here, for the last time, 
is what really happened. The trouble started just before we went on, when Augustine, for some unknown reason, suddenly took an intense dislike to Bruce Forsyth. This created a massive problem for the rest of the evening, because Bruce was comparing and could hardly be expected to skulk around backstage all night trying to avoid an angry hippopotamus. We had been given number three dressing room, which was a bit of a tight squeeze because we were sharing with Gloria Gaynor and Frankie Vaughan. However, we all mucked in together, particularly Augustine, and at first there didn't seem to be any cause for concern. We were billed to follow some Hungarian violinists and so watched the last half of their act from the wings. Bruce tapped me on the shoulder and wished me luck. At the sound of his voice, Augustine suddenly reared and head-butted Bruce in the stomach. The force of a three-and-a-half-ton hippo hitting him amidships sent Bruce careering backwards and into a bunch of Spanish acrobats practising their human pyramid routine. They collapsed like a pack of cards, with the poor fellow on top landing on Bill Haley and his comets. Their drummer took great exception to this and swung a punch at one of the acrobats, missing him completely but catching Bob Hope full in the mouth. This incensed the rest of the American contingent backstage, and within seconds a huge fight had broken out, with Sammy Davis Jr. in particular throwing punches left, right and centre. Bruce, being the ultimate professional that he is, attempted to restore order, but as soon as Augustine heard his voice, she charged again, forcing him to hurriedly shin up a nearby rope. Unfortunately, the rope was attached to a piece of scenery, and Bruce's weight on the rope brought the piece of scenery crashing down behind the Hungarian violinists, who were still on stage desperately trying to drown out the noise with a spirited rendition of Moonlight Becomes You. Now, with no scenery behind them, the entire audience, including the royal family, could see the assembled cast knocking seven bells out of each other. Billy Connolly had Vera Lynn and a headlock, while Larry Hagman and Max Bygraves were giving Julio Iglesias a right pasting. And while this ugly public brawl was happening all around me, I stood in the centre of the stage looking out at the traumatised faces in the audience. What should have been a crowning point of my career had instead quickly disintegrated into one of the most shameful episodes in the entire history of show business. And people were going to blame me. And they certainly did. The newspapers the next day were full of it. Madman Merton's hippo causes right royal rumpus was how the Daily Telegraph reported it, so you can imagine what the tabloid headlines were like. Perhaps I should stress that none of this was Billy Castell's fault. I'd signed up with the Uncle Paul and his happy hippo show without consulting him, and as always, when I took on something under my own initiative, it sooner or later proved to be a complete disaster. To avoid any further exposure to the scandal, I decided to go underground, which thanks to my knowledge of the secret tunnels was a fairly simple matter. Because I'd embarrassed the Queen during her jubilee year, I was shunned by all my high society friends anyway. With no one to talk to, I happily returned to my electric car. I barely saw daylight for the next 18 months, but I was happy. I discovered a tunnel that led directly into Harrod's food hall, so I was always well fed. I had my pick of live entertainment, popping up in the back of West End theatres and cinemas whenever the fancy took me. Sometimes, I walked around the Prime Minister's office in Downing Street at 3.30 in the morning. I can't tell you how wonderful it was, going where I pleased and never seeing anyone. It felt like London belonged to me. By mid-1979, it was reasonably safe to show my face in public again. In my absence, Augustine had teamed up with a song and dance man, and together they recorded several hit records. These were so successful that people soon forgot all about Uncle Paul, and I was able to walk around unmolested. I celebrated my 50th birthday on 25th of October 1980. I drank a bottle of cheap wine, made myself a cheese and pickle sandwich, and spent the evening watching other people on television. During the early 80s, I awoke to the nagging realisation that as much as I loved the tunnels, I still needed the public to recognise how wonderful I was. But I couldn't get work anywhere. George Orwell wrote a nightmarish novel called 1984, but if it had been me living in that year, he really would have had something to complain about. As a creative artiste, I felt the need to go back to work. Not only for myself, but also for my public. 
Sometimes the public don't know what they want, and at that time they didn't know they wanted me. Fashion was against me. Alternative comedy was the rage. For a while, anybody over the age of puberty was considered redundant. There seemed little point in contacting Billy Costell, and he clearly saw no point in contacting me. Although only in my mid-fifties, I felt my creative life was over. I was walking through Soho late one evening, wondering whether I should walk home or take the electric car, and I found myself standing outside a place called the Comedy Store. For those of you who don't know, it's a miserable little basement in the centre of London, managed by some very shady people. The Comedy Store is where spotty young performers shout and swear at the audience, and some of them even manage the difficult skill of doing both at the same time. Watching the show was a loathsome experience. Afterwards, one of the adolescent comics spotted me at the bar and I allowed him to buy me a drink. Much to my surprise, he told me that I was a big hero to comedians of his generation. Apparently, by wrecking the 1977 Royal Variety performance, I had struck an early blow for alternative comedy. Lots of young people had been inspired to become performers because of this one deliberate act of anarchy. At least that's how they saw it. I decided not to disillusion him by blaming it on the hippo. I thanked him for his kind words and went home to think. The next morning, I placed an advert in Dalton's Weekly. A week later, I received a telephone call from a producer who was putting together a television show called Shut Up, I'm Talking. He wanted to know if I had a stand-up act and would I be prepared to do three minutes the following Friday. Of course, I lied. I've never done stand-up comedy in my life, but I reasoned that there couldn't be much to it, otherwise the pimply youths I'd seen giving it a go would never have got away with it. On the night of the recording, I forgot me words and fell over the microphone stand. Out of frustration, I swore a couple of times, which for some reason the audience found hilarious. I waited for the floor manager to give me the go-ahead for a second take, but to my astonishment he waved me off the stage and the compare came back on. It took me a moment to realise I'd just taken part in a live television show, and far from being a disaster as I thought, everybody liked it. The producer said that somebody of my generation swearing at the audience was exactly what he was looking for and could I come back next week. I made some acid comment about having to learn some new swear words because I did, but the remark went completely over his head. The next morning I was front page news again. It seemed that half the country was appalled by my disgusting behaviour, but everyone under 30 thought I was a genius. I was back on the show the following week. This time I rehearsed properly. I'd noticed that the other performers on the show tended to describe real events from their own lives in what they presumably assumed was a comic fashion. I did three minutes about tunnels under London. Nobody laughed. So as a finale, I swore at the audience and once again came off the tumultuous applause. I felt I was on my way back to the top. The next morning, the most extraordinary thing happened. I received a telephone call from somebody claiming to be Billy Costell's secretary. Mr. Costell would like to see you today and wondered if 11.30 would suit you, said the female voice on the other end of the line. I confirmed that 11.30 would be fine. Mr. Costell informs me that you have his office address and that he looks forward to meeting you. The line went dead. Although I'd been businesslike on the phone, I could barely contain my excitement. I was about to meet the old man at last. He'd first represented my father in the 1920s, so at the very least, Billy had to be in his 80s. Perhaps he was dying and wanted to meet one of his most successful acts before finally fading away. I knocked on the door at 34B at exactly 11.30. A sharp-suited young man in his 30s opened the door and invited me in. Hello, I'm Billy Costell said. Shall we go for a ride? He pressed a switch on the wall and went down the stairs and climbed into an electric car. You're Billy Costell, I said as we headed for central London. I'm Billy Costell, he replied. I resented the young man for two reasons. First, I didn't like being lied to, but more important, I wasn't going to enjoy much the experience of sharing an electric car in my tunnel. For the rest of the journey I gave him the silent treatment. After 25 minutes, we stopped at a wooden platform. I'd passed it many times before, but because there was no sign indicating its precise location, I'd never bothered to stop off and have a look. We climbed the stairs, the wall slid back, 
and the two of us were standing in a large, well-decorated office. A middle-aged man entered the room, shook my hand and introduced himself. Hello, I'm Billy Castell. I had an overwhelming urge to punch him full in the face, which I somehow managed to suppress. Instead I sat down. The middle-aged Billy was the first to speak. We have a problem with your comic turn on television last night. So, write a letter to the Radio Times. Billy ignored my sarcasm and continued. Your routine about tunnels under London was most unfortunate. We really can't afford to give them any publicity. We don't want thousands of people looking for them now, do we? If the tunnels are exposed, they would have to conform to all kinds of fire regulations and safety standards, and probably the entire operation would be forced to close down. I understand what you're saying, I replied. Now tell me why you're both called Billy Castell. Two men looked at each other, and after some hesitation the following story emerged. In the early 1920s, a young theatrical agent called Billy Castell spotted a heavily disguised King George V entering a luxury ground floor flat behind the British Museum, the flat I now lived in. Intrigued by the King's odd appearance, Billy waited several hours for him to re-emerge without success. Eventually, he knocked on the front door, which hadn't been closed properly, and it swung open. Billy searched all the rooms, which were completely bare, and then made his way down to the cellar. As the front door was the only exit to the flat, Billy knew there had to be a secret passageway to explain the King's mysterious disappearance. He found it, and just like I had done some fifty years later, he explored the secret tunnels until he eventually emerged into the tiny little office behind the Goldhawk Road. He established that the office was for rent, and so made it his base. I interrupted the story at this point. Yes, but there's so much that doesn't make sense. Why would a theatrical agent insist upon communicating with his acts via Dalton's Weekly? The older Billy picked up the tale. Apparently, Billy was travelling through the tunnel one evening when he nearly collided with George V, who was travelling in the opposite direction. The King was extremely embarrassed and begged Billy not to tell the Queen because he'd get it in the neck if she ever found out. Billy, being a shrewd man, exploited the situation to his advantage. Through the King, he had several top-level meetings with various high-up members of the government. In exchange for his right to use the tunnels, Billy would work hand-in-hand -hand with the establishment to control various showbiz personalities whose prime function was to keep the public's mind off the horrible realities of everyday life. And so King George V had been happy to rehearse with Baby Paul all those years ago, because he was helping to create a new star who would stop people rebelling during the awful years of the Depression. I'd been Billy's first big success, and so in gratitude, many years later, He'd arranged for me to buy the luxury ground floor flat behind the British Museum. As it turned out, of course, this had been a mistake. Once Prince Charles had told me about the tunnels, everything else unravelled from there. And as long as Billy remained a highly secretive figure, no one could ever question his motives or strange business practice. Of course, I was absolutely dumbstruck by this news. The idea that my career, my creative art, added up to nothing more than keeping the public in some sort of a happy trance filled me with rage, and I told them so. Yes, but what you don't realise, said the younger Billy, is that you, well, don't have any talent. I jumped to my feet and screamed at him. No talent? If I've got no talent, why was I ITV Personality of the Year on two separate occasions? Answer that if you can. The older Billy spoke. I have been authorised by the British government to officially inform you that you are, and always have been, a third-rate music hall act. How dare you! I was absolutely livid. The real Billy Castell would never have spoken to me like that. The real Billy Castell tragically died over twenty years ago, said the older man. In very unfortunate circumstances, the system worked well, so we kept it going. We are just two Billy Castells. There's been dozens over the years. Ah, oh, yes, yeah. But you made a big mistake, haven't you? I said. There's nothing to stop me telling the world about you two and your ridiculous schemes. The younger Billy spoke. You never really had much luck with your wives, did you? One down a tin mine in Truro, another one fed to a hippopotamus. All right, I interrupted. 
But you can't say I haven't got talent. You can't say that. You don't get to where I am, mate, without being a personality. The two Billies exchanged a glance and the older one spoke. It is true, you know. You did say you wanted the truth. Any success you've had has been entirely due to Billy. Sometimes you've had a bit of good luck, but generally speaking, when left to your own devices, you have failed miserably. I started to argue back, but then realised he was right. I suppose I'd known it myself for years. Whenever I took a job without first consulting Billy, it was a disaster. So what happens now? I said. Well, said the older Billy, if you ever mention the tunnels again, or repeat anything you've learned today, I'm afraid the police will be asked to investigate the many disappearances that have blighted your domestic life. We could kill you, of course. That's hardly British. You don't have to, mate, I said quickly, jumping to my feet. I don't need this country. I could work anywhere. I could be an international star if I wanted to. No, I've done it before. I can do it again. Perhaps you're right. Maybe I haven't got any talent. But I've got something far more valuable. I'm a personality. And that's what people love. I'll, I'll work abroad somewhere. When I'm hosting the Eurovision Song Contest in three years' time, you're going to look pretty stupid. And sometime in the future, you'll turn around and say, uh, Oh, uh, we, ha we haven't got any good game shows on telly at the moment. And that's when you'll remember me. And you'll phone me up in France or, or Spain somewhere. And you'll beg me to come back and host a Christmas special. And do you know what I'll say? Do you really want to know what I'll say? I'll say... No. And I'll be saying it with a smile on my face. So when it comes down to it, who's the mug? Me or you? I flew to Paris the following morning. I left behind me a country that used to be Great Britain. I sold my flat behind the British Museum and eventually settled here in my luxurious Spanish villa. Spain was a bit of a shock. Finding work wasn't that easy at first. I compared a few bullfights, but in Spain, comic songs and murdering cattle don't really mix. In 1990, I got the job I'm still doing now. I co-host a programme on satellite television aimed at British expats living abroad. The programme is called Happy Hour and we broadcast live five times a day from a pub on the Costa del Sol. It's one of those English pubs that English people like to visit when they go on holiday to get away from it all. Viewers tune in to hear what the latest pub talk is about the news of the day back home. I chat to the barman about football, the National Health Service, women, that sort of thing. Occasionally we ask old Charlie, in the corner of a Guinness, about the weather. It's a good job and, yes, the drinks are free. I married my fifth wife Belinda out of loneliness, I suppose. She seemed lonely and I felt sorry for her. It's eight o'clock in the evening now. She still hasn't arrived back from Argentina. It's my 65th birthday today. I was rather hoping she might have made a special effort. There's a bottle of vintage brandy on the table in front of me. I suppose there's no harm in treating myself. <sighs> That's better. I drink a lot of brandy these days. Helps me to get into character for happy hour. I like to think I'm the best pub boy in the business. If you're looking for a loud, aggressive drunk, I'm your man. Yes. Life is good. I don't miss England. I don't miss the weather. I do miss the tunnels, though. They were happy times. I could go where I liked, nobody looking at me. Away from it all. Independent of the world. Another glass, I think. Ah. <sighs> Mum, I've spent the day dictating these memoirs into a portable tape recorder. When I'm finished, I'll send you the tape. Perhaps you can get it published somewhere. If you can get it published, make sure they leave nothing out, not a single word. Come over for Christmas and let me know how you get along. It'll be great to see you. Dad, we, Dad, we could stir a bucket of water, just for old time's sake. Yeah. 
When the book's published, I'll show whoever Billy Costell is these days. You can't muck around with baby pool. <laughs> no talent. Ha <laughs> ha, a laugh. Uh, I've got more talent in my entire body than most people have in their little finger. More brandy for me. Bastards. If it wasn't for me, a television game show wouldn't be a legitimate form of 20th century art. Yeah, I've made my mark. <sighs> all in all, there's been a mixed bag. And talking of mixed bags, where the hell is she? All I ask is she remembers my birthday and that she loves me. I suppose none out of two isn't bad. Admittedly, there's a few murders in this book, but I think people will forgive me. They love me. People do. Anyway, there's no extradition, extra, extradition, tradition, treaty between Britain and Spain, so stuff the lot of them. <laughs> it's stuff <-o. laughs> All right, just one more brandy. Hmm. Oh. Oh, I, I can hear a car coming up the drive. Oh, better late than never. We don't talk much. She doesn't speak English. She insists on talking this foreign rubbish she picked up in childhood. Oh, I'm going to bed now. So I haven't been waiting up for her. She'll see me. She'll see me asleep, and she'll know who's the boss. Oh, he stares awkward. Mustn't drop the tape recorder, camera, or a brandy. Don't remember me when the book comes out. I'll have the last laugh. Now where's that bloody light switch?